What's up, everyone? Welcome, episode 582 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. Ben Fadden here with San Diego Sports 760's John Schaefer, uh, one of the good friends of the show. He's been on a lot of different times. Um, Jim, it's a little bit of a different story, but John, he is great. Uh, John, thank you so much for coming on, man. How's it going? Ben, it's good to see you. I appreciate you having me. Um, yes, I'm with you with Jim. Uh, we have a similar relationship. You know, you, you know, we agree to, to have him on the show sometimes, both John and Jim and also talking Friars. But it's good. I'm, I'm happy baseball season's back. It's, it's fun and um, it's a long year. I'm excited it's back underway. Yeah, let's start right off. Three series down, Padres four and five. I thought it was a little bit of a disappointing first homestand. I was fine with the split, obviously, in the Soul Series. Just your, how are you feeling right now overall about how this has started here? I know people don't want to hear that it's early, but it's it is. I mean, it's less than six percent of the way through the year. Still, though, these games obviously count just as much as the ones late September. Yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic. I've been saying that, and it's truly how I feel. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna get caught up in the win loss yet. It just doesn't make sense. I'll get caught up in indicators like have they been better with men in scoring position? Yes, despite going 0 for 11 yesterday, but they win the game. So obviously, at the end of the day, that's more impactful than what you're going with men in scoring position. But there's some indicators I like. I think their offense has been pleasantly surprising by and large. Again, not perfect, but I think the bottom of the lineup has done better than I would have expected of it. I think the pitching is going to be fine. I think the starting rotation is a very good rotation. We'll see how good, but I think it has a chance to be a very good starting rotation. I think the bullpen has, has some stuff that it needs to prove to us. I was really encouraged by Robert Suarez in general yesterday with the five-out save. I think guys will will establish roles. You'll, you'll learn more about seventh and eighth innings as we go, and I think guys will find their way into it. But I think cautiously optimistic is, is fair. Um, yeah, four and five isn't perfect, but some of the things I've seen and some of the things I expect to see, um, that's how I feel, you know, 10, 10 days or so into the year. What do you think about that um, Musgrove quote about Hader? I mean, we all know he was referring to Josh Hader there yep. and how much he appreciates Robert Suarez. I thought that was amazing. Marty Caswell got the video on that. Um, yep. I, I, I went to watch the video because I wanted to see, was there like a tone there? And Joe, he's the same as always, so I didn't mm -hmm. really find that. But it was still a, an amazing quote. Yeah, uh, you know, I do feel as if they're trying to do everything in their power to kind of separate 24 from 23. And yeah. it's like we as fans or people that cover the team, you know, because of like, I don't know what the right word would be, like a PTSD or like a scar tissue. Like once you see something that looks like last year, you're like, oh, no, here we go again. But it's a long year. I mean, every team is going to lose a game 6-2 and go 0 for 5 with men in scoring position. Not that that's, you know, what I mean? every team is going to have a good series or a bad series. So I, I don't think that we should be comparing this team to 2023 for better or for worse because it's just a different team but maybe even the team feels that this idea that um you know hey yeah we don't have josh Hader, but we have someone that's more flexible or hey juan soto maybe he wasn't the perfect fit we've seen these articles obviously recently come out but um it feels like they're trying to draw a line in the sand like hey this is a different team than 2023 for better or for worse and maybe that has something to do with what joe musgrove had to say yesterday after the win yeah, what are your most encouraging starts? Let's say like three players, most encouraging starts, and then most concerning starts here. I mean, I'll be honest, you know, I, I was critical of the plan to have Jackson Merrill move positions and be a regular, but he has proved me and others wrong. Um, and we'll see what he's able to do over 162, but I think he's absolutely fit in well, right? I mean, he hasn't been asked to carry the team, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But he's absolutely fielded his position well. He's had moments. He certainly has not looked overmatched. Now we'll see what happens over 162. I've been encouraged by the start from Jake Cronworth in general. He's hit the ball harder, and he's gotten results out of that as well. I think Fernando's going to have a huge year. I really believe Fernando's going to hit 40 home runs. I think if they let him run, we'll have a ton of stolen bases as well. I think he's a brilliant defender. I think he's capable. You know, I don't know if it's going to be the Acuna year, but I think he's capable of having a top five MVP type year. I think that's more than realistic. And I wouldn't be surprised if he was, you know, finishing the top two for National League MVP. Campisano's obviously been very good as well. Um, 
you know, I still think they need to figure out exactly like is Hassan Kim, should he be in the middle of your lineup or should he be at the top of your lineup? Mm-hmm. I think that's something to consider because Kim was so good at the top of the lineup. I think Bogarts has been very good, obviously, at the top of the lineup. Um, in addition, I would just say the bullpen in general, I'm trying to learn about guys' roles. It hasn't yeah. been overly impressive. But again, I'll leave that to it's only been eight or nine games, and I think it'll work itself out. And then the rotation, uh, you know, again, hasn't been great, but I think will be fine. Um, we'll see about Matt Waldron as a fifth, but I'm not worried. A fifth starter doesn't mean to need to make 30 starts. Maybe he makes 10, somebody else makes 10, and they'll figure it out. But yeah, again, I think there's four or five guys in the lineup that have been um, really good. And um, yeah, and the pitching hasn't carried the way as of yet, but I expect that to change once this season really gets rolling. Yeah, for me, if I was going to go three encouraging, Merrill, Camposano, and Cronenworth definitely are guys yeah. that stick out to me. And concerning, again, it's, it's nine games. It's hard for me to be like, oh man, I'm really concerned. But you'd like to see more from Manny Machado. I mean, when you're getting paid that much money and you're coming off the year that he came off. I know th- there's still, I guess, the question marks about his health because he's throwing, but then he's yep. not throwing consistently to first base. I think he's throwing to second base was the latest update a little bit there. Um, and then Matt Walton, it's one outing. So like, it's, I think in incur- it's weird. Cause I'm going to get fans and they do this, right. And I'm sure they do it for you. When mm-hmm. we say that, Hey, we're encouraged by these guys and we're, we talk very positive about them, but then sometimes I say, well, it's only nine games for guys that I'm concerned about. Well, you can't have it both ways, but I mean, right. I, I think at the same time, though, with Merrill, there's things that you can look at like, no, that's going to stay there with Jackson Merrill, where with Matt Waldron, he just had a really good spring training. He's still not walking a bunch of guys. And so I still can, you know, say, hey, it's it's one outing. Let's give him a little bit more time here. And with Manny, you still look at the track record and he isn't at third base yet. So I think there's still question marks there. I think. For the encouraging things, like same thing with Cronenworth, there's things that you can actually read into, like approach-wise, what are they doing there? And it's not just, oh, he he has a good, you know, weak stretch so far, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, again, it's hard to read into anything off nine games positively or negatively, just like it's hard to read into anything off of entire spring training because we've seen guys have bad springs and good seasons or good yeah. springs and bad seasons. Um, you know, when I was in the minor leagues, they, they used to say, and I would talk to like coaches and rovers and front office executives. I mean, it's, it's hard to do any analysis of any one without 50 plate appearances, at least for a position player. And then on the other side with pitchers, I mean, you have to give them outings, right? It can't be based on an outing. It has to be multiple outings really to make any type of you know, determination on someone. So obviously it's early. Everyone understands it. I mean, we're talking on April 4th. It's early. Things will change. And that's why I would say just cautiously optimistic. I'm not, I can't guarantee this is a postseason team. I also can't say this team is worse than last year, better than last year. I'm just, there's some trends that I, that I do like, despite the quote unquote, you know, four and five start, nothing to write home about, but I think there's some things in there that lead you to believe they can do better moving forward. For sure. What did you think of Jackson Merrill's quote? I believe Marty had video on this as well about the Padres. No one really talking about them, talking about the D-backs, talking about the Giants, the Dodgers. And would he say something about when they need to actually talk about something, when people should actually talk about something, they'll be talking about the Padres. I mean, I guess find a chip wherever you can. I mean, this team traded Juan Soto. They've got some guys that they brought in that we don't know how they're going to transition to the rotation like Michael King. Sure, they acquired Dylan Cease, but I mean, the Dodgers were the team that went and spent a bunch of money. The Giants mm-hmm. went and added Matt Chapman and Blake Snell. The D backs are coming off a World Series appearance and they added as well. I mean, it's kind of deserved that the Padres aren't talked about as much as those other teams. It's not like they're playing in the AL Central or the NL Central. If that was the case, yeah. maybe it'd be a little bit different. Right. I agree with you. I mean, I think, you know, Jackson Merrill's 20, which is amazing mm-hmm. that he's having this level of success and starting the major leagues and switching positions. Um, I think you need to be a little careful in terms of what you are saying to the media. I mean, he said that maybe eight games into the season or seven. I mean, this idea that, hey, nobody's talking about us. Well, that's a better conversation to have in September if you've proven yourself to be a playoff caliber team. Hey, we're, you know, we're 16 games over 500. We're, you know, within eight games of the Dodgers with, with 18 to play. We, you know, I'm making this up. We've put, you know, people weren't saying we were capable of doing this. Look what we've done. We feel as if, we cannot just get in but compete 
when we get in. I'm not, I wouldn't talk at all about the Dodgers or the Giants or the Diamondbacks April 3rd. I mean, you, no team has proven anything. I don't hear the Dodgers saying, hey, we're the best team in baseball. Off a 7-2 and two start, they might say it when they're 140, if they get to that point. Someone maybe would say that. I remember Juan Soto a year ago early said something along the lines of, hey, you know, everyone thinks the Dodgers are the best team in the, in the, in the West, but it goes – you remember he had yeah, these very he said, Yeah, he comments. said it was on the TBS pregame show, yeah. and I think it was at City Field, and he was like, the Dodgers need to worry about us. We're not worried about them. Like yeah, little things like that where it's – yeah, you don't need yeah. to say that. You don't need to say it, and at the end of the year, you look up, and, you know, the Padres weren't anywhere near the Dodgers. Now, the Dodgers didn't have a good postseason either, but it's like, just be be careful. Let's let's just let everything happen on field. You know, let, let's do the talking on field is what I would say about this team. But, again, I, I, I'm encouraged by Jackson Merrill. I'm absolutely encouraged. I'm sure there'll be learning curves both off-field and on-field for him. He's 20. I mean, imagine that. It's really incredibly impressive. But um, I wasn't enamored by the quote, but I am – Encouraged by the way he's played. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you talk about the age. I mean, me playing in the big leagues right now and doing well in the big leagues, like I can't imagine that. Like that's just – so it's it's impressive. And staying on Merrill here for a second, it's been refreshing to see a Padres homegrown guy come up. I know Tatis, we consider him pretty much homegrown. Mm -hmm. But Merrill come up and it looks like he belongs in the big leagues. We look at guys like Manny Margot and Hunter Renfro, like there were spurts there, or Carlos yep. Oswahe or Austin Hedges. Go down the line of guys that come up. C.J. Abrams, I think he was a little underwhelming. Come up, and it's like there's there's room there to be desired to for fans to actually like fall in love with this guy. Where with Merrill, I feel like that's already happening, and it's just refreshing, especially when he's down at the bottom of the order. You talk about not him needing to do too much right now. And I love him being down there, turning it over to the top like that and having that approach that he has. I think that's been part of this Padres team's success when they have had success. I don't, I don't see him as like the reason why they're four and five right now, not, you know, uh, five and four. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would say this, the, the Merrill start is everything you would you would hope for the the biggest part of this game in general whether you're 20 or 30 and you're 30 and you're heading towards the hall of fame like manny machado or you're 20 and you're trying to prove yourself and become an everyday regular on a on a good team and just stick is that teams will adjust to you and then you have to adjust back there is no book on jackson merrill he has i'm making it up 25 plate appearances i don't have it in front of me in the big leagues so What's going to happen over a period of time is they're going to say, listen, he's able to hit, you know, fastballs up and in, but he can't hit breaking pitches away. I'm completely making it up. And then, of course, the book will become, well, he's got to be fed breaking pitches once we get ahead, because until he proves he can hit breaking pitches when behind in the count, that's all he's going to see. Then can he make the adjustment? And I don't have an answer as to whether he can or cannot. I do know, like Xander Bogarts has said, like Manny Machado has said as well, that inevitably there'll be a struggle. And that's not a, that's not a knock on Merrill. There have been struggles for Manny Machado and Xander Bogarts in the, in the middle of their careers. Just how do you deal with that? That's the part that I really want to see. You almost want to see how a player deals with adversity, which is inevitably coming, and can he get to the other side of it sooner rather than later. So we'll find that out. All players struggle over 162 at some point, other than like MVP caliber players, even those players. I mean, Juan Soto was sixth in National League MVP voting last year, and he struggled at times a year ago. So what happens when there's a book on him? How does he adjust to it? And how does that impact him and the team? He's actually got 25 at-bats. Is that like, what it is? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 107 OPS plus, 761 OPS Good. right now. It's It's... I'll take that, you know, in your yep, first definitely. 25 at-bats in the big leagues when you're 100%. hitting ninth in the order, totally. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think about Schilt really against lefties so far having a Zokar go play center field and not Merrill? I feel like that's easing him in to the big leagues, but at the same time, I want this guy playing every day, especially like yesterday where there's an off day today. And, okay, I'm, it's nothing against Jose Zokar really. It's just... I want to see Merrill, what, he can't hit off of a guy that's not even in the Cardinals rotation. He's only pitching because Sonny Gray's hurt. He's got to face left-handed pitching. I mean, he has to. You can't be a platoon player at 20. That's not who they're asking him to be. I mean, if they see his upside like they're telling us they see his upside, then he's not a guy that makes 100 starts. He's a guy that makes 150 starts, and you can't make 150 starts if you're not facing 
left-handed starting pitching. Now, I'm not opposed to, and actually Mike Schill kind of said this, hey, we're not going to be thinking about pinch hitting for him late in games just against left-handed pitching. I'd prefer pinch hitting for him against elite left-handed relievers as opposed to not starting him yeah. against left-handed starters, right? So if you get into an eighth inning and you have a guy that hits lefties coming off your bench, then pinch hit if the circumstance calls for it. But I'm with you. I think, you know, again, Azoka has got to play. But Merrill really has to play as a 20-year-old. He should be starting six times a week, absolutely five, but between five and six times a week. And I'm not just sitting him because it's a left-handed starting pitcher, even though that's what they've seemingly done the first week and a half of the year. If you were GM for a day, what would be that move that you would make? Is it Tommy Pham? Is it trading for Luisa Rice, who the Padres were interested in in spring training? They reportedly made a strong offer. I'm still wondering the fit there. Like Financially, there's room, but not a lot of room after if you acquire a rise and you'd be having him be the DH when Manny goes and plays third. And it's not like he is a power hitter. Like what would you rather go with Tommy Pham there? What, what move there would you do? Yeah, it's interesting because I don't think Pham's the better player, but I think he's the better fit. Like, I think at this point you're probably addressing a need you're in season. You know, there's no guarantee you know, you get a little concerned when you get a guy that has a high batting average in baseball and then you bring him to San Diego. You know, Jim brought up the, the idea Adam of Adam Frazier. Frazier. Not, yeah. And, and Luis Arise has had a much longer track record than Adam Frazier did in the big leagues. I mean, he's a legitimate hitter. He's hit 314 in his career in a non-good hitting yard of Miami and in, in not a great lineup historically either. So he can flat out hit. There's no question about that. I know he's gotten off to a slow start. That doesn't concern me at all. But yeah, does it? do you need him? Again, everyone wants a guy that can get on base, but I, I just don't know if that's the need right now where I do think left field is ultimately going to be a need. It's not going to expose itself in seven or 10 days necessarily, but over 162, I think it really will. Fam is probably more cost effective. In fact, he is. I mean, Arise yeah. makes 10.6, I think, this year, which means he makes 15 next year, somewhere in that neighborhood in arbitration. And Fam is not going to get that at this point. He's not going to get near that would be my guess. So if you get Fam at half the price of a rise and you're not guaranteeing or committing to someone in 2025 either by getting Tommy Fam, and you're filling the one true need or a true need that you have, um, I kind of lean that way. I like Luis Arise. I absolutely do. Um, I think he can he could help, but I just don't know if it's like an end-all be-all player, a guy that doesn't possess power, that relies heavily on batting average on balls in play. Yeah. If there's any regression there at all, that could be impactful. It's a decent amount of money for a guy that doesn't hit with power. You don't have that exact need. So, I mean, 51-49, maybe I'd go with Fan for 2024 over the risk of trading away talent to acquire yeah. Luis Arise. And I'm looking at what would the Marlins be wanting? They're not going to want Hassan Kim for one year. They're, they're going to be wanting the prospects. And, yep. yeah, for Arise, I just think there's – there's question, and maybe it's be, just because of our past of Adam Frazier, of guys like that, that the Padres have acquired, and then it just hasn't worked out the same. But I, I'm looking at this lineup. If Cronenworth continues to be himself and not try to be someone that he wasn't like last year, that he's not, and we don't think Hassan Kim is going to be like this the rest of the year. Hopefully, Manny can be healthy. We'll see what you can get out of Bogarts. I, I really. It's like the infield, it feels like, yeah, it's set. And the DH spot, maybe the Padres want to leave that open a little bit, rotate some guys. Where with left, pro far, sure, good start. But I view it more like Tyler Wade, like, sure, good start. But is that sustainable? Is that really who this guy is going to be? You know, 2022, sure, we can remember it like it was yesterday, but it wasn't yesterday. It was a long time ago. So, Pro far, I just question how long he's going to be able to get on base at this, you know, this rate that he is right now. Um, last question I had, and this is obviously regarding the San Diego State Aztecs. John, if you listen to Jim, he will say that John was not on the show for a couple of weeks, but he was actually hmm. in Boston um, doing the radio show. Call or yeah, you were you yep. had your radio stuff in Boston with you. So yep. I would say, Jim, actually, John's committed to the show. Um, <laughs> but how, just that overall experience, like sweet 16 run, the experience being there for that again, obviously last year, all the way to the national championship game. But that just seemed like, especially going to Boston for that facing UConn. Um, I know it was not as close as last year's national championship game, but UConn just seems like a different 
they're just in a different category than the rest of basketball teams in college basketball. So I just look at it really as this is a heck of a two-year stretch for the Aztecs here, and they're set up pretty darn well. You said it right, Ben. I mean, it's it's really special. I, I hope people kind of understand in San Diego, and I think they do. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of passion for specifically San Diego State men's basketball. I think in general, since I've been here, SDSU athletics has really risen. Maybe that has to do with this post-Chargers era. Maybe it has to do with the success in general as well. Um, but, you know, it's hard to do. Like, I'm looking at teams that are in the Final Four this year, and they're like, first time since 1980. For Purdue, the Aztecs were there last year. First time since 1983 for NC State, you know, with Jim, Jimmy Valvano uh, winning a national championship in 83. First time ever for Alabama with all of their resources in a Final Four. Um, it's fun. I'm telling you, man, there's nothing like the NCAA tournament. It's an amazing event, and it puts everyone on equal footing. It's a one-and-done tournament, and it's fun. I mean, it's a whirlwind. Like, I, even the last three weeks, Vegas, Spokane, Boston, over a three-week run. The year prior... I was in Vegas, Orlando, Louisville, Houston over four weeks. It's just it's just a unique, great American sporting event that I think is only rivaled by like the Super Bowl, really, in terms of like the spectacle that it is. And the beauty of it is you just don't know. But San Diego State has been so consistently good. I mean, obviously, it was Steve Fisher initially, but the job Brian Dutcher has done is just it's one of the best jobs in America. It is just as simple as that. I mean, to reach consecutive Sweet 16s and really – they had the 30 and two team we'll never know about. They, I mean, they've been in the tournament five straight years if you include 30 and two, and how can you not? And six of seven years under Brian Dutcher. So it's just, a, it's a, it's been a hell of a ride. Boston was a really cool experience. I'm with you. Connecticut, I think, is just a cut above. I think they're historically good. They got to prove that this week in Phoenix. But if they win it again, they're historically good. They're one of the greatest college basketball teams ever if they can complete a two year run like they're in the midst of potentially completing. So it doesn't take away from San Diego State. That's what, that's what I've been saying. I mean, you, you, you can't take away from a Sweet 16 team. Um, their accomplishments speak for them themselves, and I'm excited already for next year. Yeah, so set the table for what's coming up here. Obviously, Chris Acker goes to Long Beach State, so there's going to be an assistant that is going to have to come in and be on Dutch's staff. Uh, Micah Parrish, is he going to come back? Reese Waters, I believe there's a question mark there as well. Lamont, mm -hmm. is, is he, he's done, right? Or does he have an no? He's got a year of eligibility. Okay, that's interesting. I mm -hmm. I was not thinking that that would even be a possibility. But what are the chances of those guys coming back and just kind of set this table for this off season here now for San Diego? Yeah, State? I mean every off season is so critical with the portal. You know, basically every player on every team is now a free agent, which is incredible. I mean, even a year ago you wouldn't have said that because there was a one time transfer exception where you could transfer without sitting out. That's what it was deemed a year ago, but. Essentially, courts have, courts have gotten involved and the NCAA hasn't challenged it, which is you can transfer as often as, you, as you'd like. So now you can have multiple time transfers that don't have to sit out, which means any player can transfer at any point. I think you have basically half of college basketball players in the portal. Think about that. That's, there's 5,000 college basketball players, roughly 4,000 still have eligibility, and pushing 2,000 are in the portal, over 1,500. So half of college basketball players are in the portal. It's just the new normal. But um, I think you're building around some of your young core, Elijah Saunders and Miles Bird, presuming that they will be back. And Mark Ziegler's kind of quoted with them saying, you know, they're going to be the core of the team. And um, they have a really good young player. They redshirted. It's about seven foot, Magoon Guath, that mm -hmm. I think is going to be a household name next year that's going to be really impactful. And then out of Butler, Waters, Parish, how many, if any, return? And that's critically important. If you get two of those back, I think you're well on your way towards being towards the top of the Mountain West Conference and putting yourself in position to make the NCAA tournament. And then what they do in the, in, um, in the portal, you know, they, they don't have the same resources as Kansas or Kentucky when it comes to name, image, and likeness with their collective, but they're, they're doing well. I mean, their collective will be over a million dollars for the upcoming year, which gives them a little bit of wiggle room when they go out into the portal. Plus they have like a really highly sought after class in terms of a freshman class that doesn't necessarily impact you day one, but they have multiple four-star players out of Las Vegas that are coming in for next year. So I think they're set up well when you consider the landscape of college basketball and how volatile it is. Dutch has always done well in his staff in the portal. I mean, they, they pick the right player. They get the right fit. I'm sure that's what they'll attempt to accomplish this year. But, yeah, I mean, Waters, Butler, Parrish, I think if you get a couple of those back, you're putting yourself in a position where you can hopefully run this back again in 2025. Yeah, and being at the top of the Mountain West is going to be crucial because who knows if the Mountain West is going to be it's, it, let's face it, it's probably yep. not going to be as good as it was this year. 
And yep. we already, like, even this year, the committee didn't want to put as many teams in as they did. I mean, just look at two teams that had to be in the play-in games. Um, so, yeah, it's, and the, remember, there's, obviously, you know this, but just to the audience about the whole Mountain West schedule and their increasing the amount of conference games, which yep. I think hurts San Diego State. It hurts other teams in the conference as well. So, yeah, it's going to be important to do well in the Mountain West, as is every year. Um, sure. All right, John Schaefer, thank you so much for the time. Obviously, I have the links to the YouTube to subscribe to John and Jim, Padres Wrap-Up Show. Make sure to do that. Great stuff over there, John and Jim. I'll get Jim on here sometime. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much, John, for coming on. This episode brought to you by Gaglione Bros, famous cheesesteaks and garlic fries. Main location is on Friars Road. And they're inside Snapdragon Stadium and Petco Park. I'll see everyone later in the week. And yeah, thanks everyone for watching.